Hello and welcome to my channel, Vice Rhino here. Oh, wait, wrong intro. <laughs> Hello, everybody. This is Jackson Wheat, definitely. Uh, and I'm on today with our wonderful uh, producer, Peter, as always, and our co host, the one, the only Dapper Dinosaur, who is not in the intro. I said it first. You can't. That's you can't true. Do it now. I am, in fact, Dapper Dinosaur, the most frequent guest on this channel who, and. One of the few guests who is still not in the intro. I already, I said the thing already. You can't do that. Did I lie? Uh, um, so as okay. as the person All having right. as the person having made the intro, um, the people who are featured in the intro are the people who've been on Jackson's channel as a guest for a conversation. So, oh, well, I mean, you know, we're having what a conversation. Yeah, well, so I was there with with uh, P with Paleo Logos for that conversation. That is, yeah, no, that's, no, that's the 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 people I mean were that that was a special just about that particular guest. Well, oh. well, Dapper, tell you what, why don't you come on <laughs> as my one and only guest, and I will have a chat with you, and then you can be in the intro. How does that sound? Mm, okay, I'll interview you. We'll talk about. I'll ask you about um, your hats, and sure. your ties. And yeah. that little aquarium in your in the background there. It, it is a very nice aquarium. It is a very nice aquarium. I, I like it a lot. Very clear. All Thank right. You. So hello everyone in the uh the the outside world, like Ben Hoven and Smitty and Brian Stevens and George Gomez. Hello, welcome everyone. I'm not sure we, that's not Jorge Gomez. Or it could be Jorge Gomez. I apologize. Um we have finished the Mesozoic. We're in the final era so far of the Phanerozoic Eon. Now, I recommend we just skip over this because it's basically boring since there aren't very many dinosaurs at this point. But what apparently... There are lots of dinosaurs at this point. What are you talking about? Not comparatively. I, I mean, eh, I don't know. How many species of non-avian dinosaurs do we know versus how many species of avian dinosaurs? No, it's not about how many are we actually know. It's about how prevalent they were in the ecosystem. Because you know that any given fossil assemblage, we're only going to capture a fraction of the actual diversity of any given taxon. Someone just sounds salty right now. That's what it sounds like. I mean, I'm just, not going to disagree with you. It sounds like some salt. Anyways. I'm just saying the Cenozoic's not as good as the Mesozoic. <laughs> Uh, you heard it here first, folks. Dapper's uh, running in with the spicy takes. Uh, so. I mean, anyone who knows my take on pelagic tunicates already knows that I can dish out a spicy take from time to time. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes, absolutely. Um, all right. So let's get into the Cenozoic. Da -da -da -da. The Cenozoic. Yay. So the Cenozoic lasted from uh, the end of the the Cretaceous. So that was about 66 million years ago, as Dapper uh, walked us through. And the uh, the end was punctuated with a big freaking rock, which hit the Earth, and uh, made you know really bad days for some different clades of animals and plants and things. But now we're in the Cenozoic. Um, which last, which well, the which is divided into epochs rather than periods. So, at this point, because the epochs are substantially shorter than the periods are, remember the Cretaceous lasted from like 146 to 66 million years ago. Well, each of the epochs tends to last from like, you know, at most like 15 million years, something like that. Much much shorter slices of time. And by the time we get to the what is it the the quaternary or the you know, the Pleistocene, it's like what two million years ago to like eleven thousand years ago, something like that. It's a very very small slice of time. So yeah, the Holocene is absurdly short. Yes, yeah, so far, <laughs> right? So far, unless you're watching in the year thirty thousand, 
in which case, hello, welcome. Glad to have you. You should it probably find some pretty short. Some more recent media, you know. Yeah. Also, the... <laughs> I'm very impressed that you bothered to learn this ancient language that we're using right now. Right. <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, so, okay. So the the first epoch of the Cenozoic is the Paleocene, uh, and it lasted from 66 to about 56 million years ago. So the non-avian dinosaurs are wiped out, and as of yet, there are no um, there are no no fossil assemblages in which any non-avian dinosaurs survived into the Cenozoic. Lots and lots of avian dinosaurs survived, but so far it looks like no uh, no non-avian dinosaurs. So sorry, Mokele and Membe fans out there. So sorry. Uh, but in the absence of the dinosaurs, the mammals began radiating into the niches that were left open by them. Now, mammals stayed relatively small in the Paleocene, except for a few groups like the Pantodonts, who got fairly large. But most groups were still like maybe about the size of a like your a medium sized dog, basically. I was actually about to say you say that the mammals are getting all these megafaunal niches, and you, you show Carbonemus, Titanoboa, and Purosaurus. So you know. Hey, we'll get there. Uh, we'll we'll get there. Uh, I I showcase them because these guys are all from the uh, what late Paleocene, early Eocene. Um, because you have this this event called the Paleocene Eocene Thermal Maximum. So it seemed like, at least from what I remember of it, uh, increased volcanism in the North Atlantic Igneous Province caused uh, a raising of of Earth's temperature, uh, and this allowed reptiles to or some reptiles to get fairly large like titanoboa how do you remember how long titanoboa is because I, I don't remember offhand i don't remember offhand it was but I absurdly do large that for no reason they're venomous in the game arc survival evolved yeah that that doesn't really make any sense no, um but titanoboa was ludicrously large for a snake mm -hmm. it would not Largest want known ever snake yeah and i think carbon Nimis was like the size of a like a smart car, wasn't it? It was. It was also extremely large. Yeah, yeah. It was. It was probably weighed about as much as a car too. Yeah, turtles yeah, are guys... not known to be light. Well, right. Yeah, and there and there were even some very large turtles in the Pleistocene, like uh, Miolania, which I don't. I don't think I have a picture for him, but he was a cool dude. He was in uh, Australia. Also, not technically out. a turtle, wasn't it? Oh, uh, it may have been like pan test two dines rather than test two dines or something like yeah. that. I don't quite remember turtle systematics. Might be. Well, my memory from having worked on it myself and also seeing, you know, you and I basically were doing turtle stuff around the same time, mm -hmm. was that it as well as Ninjemis were technically mm. not in crown test two, di test two dines mm. because um, they were actually basically branching to both Pleurodeers Plurid and Cryptodeers, which are the only mm. two extant lineages of true turtles. They were gotcha. just outside. And they had horns. They did have horns. Also, Ninjami's fun fact is named after the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Yes. The etymology in that paper is in allusion to that totally rad, fearsome foursome epitomizing shelled success, <laughs> which is just an amazing etymology. And then it's like Emmys, which is turtle, you know. So. Right. <laughs> <laughs> just absolutely fantastic name. No notes. Oh, okay. yeah. So. That was um so the the Paleocene Eocene Thermal Maximum PETM also um culminated in like a, a small extinction event for some groups. Um, but it, it wasn't it wasn't enough to be considered like a mass extinction. Which I mean of course anytime the, the temperature of the planet dramatically rises or falls in a geologically short period of time, you're gonna have an extinction or a series of extinction events. It's just gonna happen. Um organisms won't are, can't necessarily adapt in some places um fast enough so it happens anything you'd like to add um just that i'm hoping that pretty soon we can get to the eocene where the first mammals occur <laughs> allegedly according to at least one person i've heard talk about it we can say his name steven meyer this yeah. video is out now it's it's out everybody should go watch the video that i uh co-wrote for professor dave which is uh, dunking on Stephen Meyer. Dunking pretty hard too. Yeah, Stephen Meyer is is dumb. So there's that. All right. 
Well, if, uh, if nothing else, then next slide, please. Okay, so here we have, uh, and we mentioned this in the last uh, video, or sorry, the, the, last, yeah, the last installment of the series, where we have crown, you know, we have crown mammals um, that are not still alive who were in the, who uh, managed to beat the, uh, the, the meteorite and survive into the early Cenozoic, such as the multi-tuberculates and the dryolestids. But they kind of fizzled out early on. Maybe they just couldn't compete. They couldn't, you know... Uh, it, they couldn't hack it against the majesty of the placental mammals, obviously. Well, or the maybe the monotremes <laughs> or the marsupials. Who knows? Um, there are, yeah. interestingly, in, in uh, Hattag Island, the uh, the little multi-tuberculates managed to survive. The the It's like three or four genera, all from Hattag Island. They all survived the uh, Cretaceous impactor. And so... <laughs> And, and straggled over and like into the Paleocene for a little bit. So. It's kind of like uh, you know, was it New Zealand still has sphenodons? Yeah, yeah. So you get you we get a few little islands. stragglers here and there. Yes, yeah, that's true. Yeah, as we because as we mentioned uh, last time, uh, primitive um, forms tend to survive better on islands because there are fewer uh, and more advanced forms to compete with, typically. So yeah, so these groups were all around. So, uh, much to Meyer's chagrin, monotremes, marsupials, and placental mammals were all definitely around <laughs> prior by to the, the Cretaceous. Eocene. Yeah, they were they were around. Um, yeah, prior to the the end of the Cretaceous. Uh, in fact, the earliest um, placental mammal is considered. Or I think the earliest is Frutifossor, which is from like uh, latest. Jurassic. So, also your elephant cartoon is adorable on there. Well, he's not mine. He is a uh, David Gross Nickel at all's elephant cartoon. Well, thank you very much, David M. Gross Nickel at all. I suspect it might have been part of the at all group because my guess is that the the, the artist was not lead author on that paper. <laughs> Pro probably not. Although, unless it's like uh, Darren Nash, because he can both like draw and write technical papers. True, but I feel like if Darren Nash were on this paper, he might actually be the lead author. That's that's probably true. Yeah. Yep. Uh, anything you want to add to this? Um, I mean, I think we already covered with the like, yeah, mammal diversity of at least the three major groups of mammals goes way farther back than um, the Cenozoic, basically. Mm -hmm. Yep. And then once the non-avian dinosaurs were wiped out, then a lot of a lot of niches were left open. Although <laughs> some. Uh, avian theropods actually reclaimed a couple niches um, or some sort of uh, non-avian dinosaurian niches yeah. like uh, Gastornis and Forest Rachis and a few other terror tall, birds scary wind. birds. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Called aptly the terror birds. <laughs> yeah, that's their common name and they, uh, they were pretty terrifying. They're taller than you are. Yeah, I've seen uh, images of like the, the Gastornis skull next to an ostrich skull and it's ridiculous. I've seen a full Gastornis skeletal mount. It's <laughs> it's intimidating. Yeah I, <laughs> yeah, I bet it is. It's like, yeah, I'll pass. I'm going to meet one of those in real life. <laughs> yeah, who would have been preying on, like, you know, early horses and things like that. Yeah, basically. Yeah, also, there, there was... running crocodiles. Planocranids. Do you have a slide on the Planocranids? Uh, what's the if next you... slide? I don't think I do, unless Oh, he's... my goodness. Peter, next slide, please. Oh, well, this, this is just sort of highlighting the diversity of... All right, we might have to talk a little bit about planet cranids before okay. we go on to the, yes. to the Eocene. We'll absolutely do that. Um, so this is just a, sort of an overview of placental mammal um, phylogeny. So you have, at this point in time, the consensus is leaning for placental mammals towards two clades. One is Atlantogenata, which is Afrotheres and Xenarthrans. So Afrotheres are the the native African mammals, elephants, elephant shrews, golden moles, tenrax, manatees, all those guys. And then Xenarthrans are the native South American mammals, or, or, or a group of native South American mammals like armadillos, sloths, and anteaters. And then the other group are is uh, Laurasia theory, or is, is called Boreo eutheria which contains the Laurasia theres and the Uarchontogliers. So Laurasia theria is 
probably most mammals. I guess you could just say it's most mammals. It's like hoof mammals, carnivorous mammals, uh, bats, um, a lot of like small insectivorous mammals like shrews and hedgehogs and uh, moles. Those are all, and they all interestingly originated in North America, hence why they're called Laurasia thares. Laurasia is North America and Eurasia. Um, and then you are called to Glyra. Uh, uh, Glyra refers to uh, the rodents and lagomorphs, so the rabbits and the pika. And then Yorkanta refers to primates as well as things you may or may not be familiar with, like tree shrews and kalugos. Although actually, tree shrews are up, up for debate whether they're Yorkanta, but kalugos are definitely like a uh, sister to primates. So they're cute. Yeah, but guys. Jackson, what good is half a wing? A kalugo is is as good as half a wing. Okay. And they're adorable. Look up a picture of a kalugo if you guys haven't seen it. They're adorable from the dorsal side. <laughs> you know, I guess that's true. I should have should have clarified. The ventral side is a, a little less adorable. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, I also appreciate. So there is. A, a, I'll um, I'll give my spicy take. Um, the correct Laurasia theria phylogeny is uh, Scrotifera. Um, oh. That's my that's my spicy take. So okay. with that, what Scrotifera refers to, and it's very it's weirdly poorly, named. It's poorly named. It's very poorly named. Um, but the phyl but the 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 uh, well, basically all of the phylo all the phylogenies basically agree that like Eulipatifla, so the the shrews, um, moles, and hedgehogs like branch most basally with regard to everybody else. Then. Uh, then it starts becoming a question of, well, I think typically bats are also considered to branch next. Then you have the fish fights. Where do carnivorans, the dog and cat-like carnivores, uh, where do they branch with regard to the hooved mammals? So Scrotifera, which makes the most sense, argues that um, the dog and cat-like carnivorans are, you know, they're grouped together. And, and that's also not a really no one's really disputing that but they are sister to the pangolins follow dota so that's what that argues and then the odd and even hoof mammals so that's perissodactyla and and <laughs> and artiodactyla uh uh oh dapper they did the thing at the bottom they said said artiodactyla yeah said artiodactyla is bullshit um but so perissodactyls and artiodactyls group together which i think makes the most sense like Morphologically, that makes clearly the most sense. What about um, Noto Ungulata then? Oh, so Noto Ungulata, um, from what I've seen, uh, tends to like his sister, to, or sorry, is like basally branching with regard to Perissodactyla. Yeah, that's the latest I've seen too. Yeah, that's typically what I've seen. I saw for those of very... you who don't know all of these words, Noto Ungulata is an odd group of South American uh, ungulates that went extinct, I think, even before humans got there. Yes, yeah, they were they were gone in, at I think like early Holocene, basically. Yeah, I think around around the time that the uh, the land bridge between North and South America forms, they start a steep decline as North American predators that they are not equipped to deal with start coming in. Right. Yeah. Absolutely. And we I do have a slide uh, on them, so we'll talk about them later on. Oh, nice. Um, but I think like, and I've talked to. Uh, some mammologists and they're like, yeah, Scrotifera makes the most sense. The The reason this is a debate was there are some or have been some papers. Scrotifera more recently seems to be the, like the growing consensus, but there was debate for a while because um, there was a paper back in like 2010 or something like that, uh, that argued carnivorans were sister to Perissodactyla to the exclusion of Artiodactyla. Nah, I'm not buying it. Yeah, like, what do you, first of all, what do you expect to find in the fossil record for that? Like, how, how would that work? Um, first of all, that means hooves evolved twice, which, like, um, that's weird. Well, we, as we're about to get into later on, they did evolve at least twice. So, you know. Yeah, I mean. Actually, maybe three times if we include the weird hadrosaur front feet. <laughs> I guess, but it, eh, it's yeah, still less parsimonious than having one origin for hooves among hoofed uh, mammals. 
Yeah, plus, as we'll talk about in a little bit, there are some very uh, early, like, uh, there's some Paleocene placental mammals, which look like what the ancestor of all hoof mammals probably would have looked like. So, um, yeah, I don't really buy the, uh, what's the other, uh, Pegasophere is what it's called, Pegasophere. Um, so, yeah, that's Perissodactyla um, plus uh, Carnivora. And Pangolins. Yeah, I think it's yeah, I think it's carnivores and pangolins, and then uh, yeah. persidactyla. Let's say that Pegasus ferre is the clade of uh, carnivores and yes. pangolins. Right. Yeah. But yeah, yeah, no, I don't really buy it. Uh, it's my spicy take. So, I mean, it's it. It seems like a fair number of mammologists agree with that at this point. So, eh, maybe not so spicy. It's a mild, mild take. Here, here's a spicy take. Uh, when you find out that cetaceans nest inside Artiodactyla, you don't get to rename Artiodactyla. What Agreed. you get to do is you get to demote cetacea from being an order. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. Make it a suborder. I don't care. Make it, <laughs> it whatever arbitrary rank that you want to assign it is fine, as long as it's below order, and you don't get to rename things. That's why also if the uh, Ornithosquida hypothesis about uh, ornithischians and sauropods <laughs> grouping together closer than uh, sauropods. Sorry, that makes sauropods not dinosaurs if that's true. You don't get to just redefine dinosauria because it's inconvenient for you that previously uh, that members that previously met the definition no longer do based on new conclusions. Right. Sauropods are now dinosauriformes. Right, because it's, it's live. Columba, Livia, plus Triceratops, isn't it? Isn't that that's, dinosaurs? That's one of them. I've also seen Tricer uh, Tyrannosaurus rex and Triceratops hortus. I've also seen Iguanodon and um, Megalosaurus because for historical reasons, it was like the first right. two discovered. Right. Um, okay. But yeah, all of those right. definitions would cover the same group of animals, whether or not Ornithoscleta mm. is true. Right. But if Ornithoscleta right. is true, it excludes sauropods. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yep. You have to find uh, they they'll become like dinosauriforms or dinosaur morphs instead of dinosaurs. <laughs> yep. Not dinosaurs anymore. Yep. That's which just is how so. it is. Yeah. Nothing. Which is funny because like, you know, nothing about their anatomy, their behavior, none of that changes as mm -hmm. a result. These these oh, are as animals. Are, it's 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 like when Pluto was no longer a planet. It's like right. the object itself did change not at all. It just felt a little bit sadder. No, it didn't even do that because it didn't give a <laughs> crap what stupid humans, like you know, several light hours away, were talking about. Like it doesn't care. It's just that's, going around, that's what you orbiting think. its berry center along with Karen and a couple other moons, hanging out, out outer reaches of the solar system, being all cold, having a Pluto-shaped marking on the object, coincidentally called Pluto because of pareidolia. It's great stuff. <laughs> Similarly, the sauropods wouldn't even care if they were still around. They would just go on eating some plants. Yep. They would just be vibing. Mm -hmm. um, all right. Next slide, please. And they would still be stem birds. <laughs> all right. We're moving on. So this here's some just some sundry paleo, paleocene fauna. So like I said, um, it's difficult to pick like particular lineages that you know we're like evolving in this time period because it's so short and adaptive radiations typically take like several million years so you might have an adaptive radiation that starts in the paleocene but terminates like in the eocene or oligocene you know that happens so now, i'm seeing something on here that i was under the impression was just made up <laughs> oh my god okay all right folks arn raw put out a video um few weeks ago a month ago i don't know time is time isn't real uh w in which he was uh you know critiquing the uh was the genesis apologetics i think um and he he sent me the script was, yeah, for this I'm pretty sure it was big wave dave from genesis apologetics no it was it was the two the two idiots oh um, was it yeah john they were doing, and jane i think yeah john and jane um they were doing a whole like jeopardy bit which was so stupid uh but i <laughs> He like he sent me the the script or whatever, and he was like, "Hey, can you make sure it looks fine?" And so, uh, so I, I had to watch the video, of course, to make sure the script sounded fine. And in uh, in doing so, at one point, Jane says that like mesonychids 
were imaginary. And I had to rewind multiple times to make sure I heard her correctly that she did in fact say Mezzanikids are an imaginary group of animals. Mm -hmm. Like, just so I don't want to straw man her. If she didn't in fact say that, I don't want to claim that she did say that. It's certainly what the words that she said meant. It's... Maybe they weren't <laughs> intended to mean that, but it's what they meant. Right, right. And it wasn't yeah. super ambiguous either. Yeah, I was kind of like, did she really say that? Is that a thing? Yeah. Yeah. So, Mezzanikids um, were considered, even by the time they made this video, this, the, the information they were dealing with was way outdated, but uh, Mezzanikids were considered to be the ancestors of whales for quite a long time. Um, they have, like, they have some cranial uh, and skeletal morphology, which seem sort of similar uh, to, like, early whales like Basilosaurus, and so it seemed like these guys were well, I mean, they were artiodactyls who were predatory. It's the right. kind of thing you would expect. Right, right, exactly. Which, you know, eventually researchers did find actual you know, predatory ancestors of whales uh, yeah. who, were, who were much more closer to them, of course. Um, but yeah, but Sinonyx, which was an, an early Mesonychid, so these guys are... I don't remember where exactly among the ungulates they nest nowadays. Do you happen to know offhand? Uh, you keep going. I'm going to find out. Okay. Um, so another guy we have is uh, Osapaya, or Osapaya, which is a little shrew-like guy. I think they found just like parts of his jaw, and that's why just his head is pictured here, uh, which is an early Afrothair. So that little guy is probably what the common ancestor of elephants and manatees and tenrex and elephant shrews look like, which, again, kind of makes sense. I mean, most mammals in the Mesozoic were little shrew-like guys, so makes sense that the the common ancestors of the major clades would also look pretty shrew like they wouldn't be super specialized be very generalized little insectivores oh i'm we're seeing mesonike is currently being considered to be just outside of crown ungulata okay that that kind of makes sense i could believe that mm -hmm. um also again like you know the the common because well if they're outside of crown ungulata so the the common ancestor of like Fare and Ungulata, or Ungulata, whichever one it is, I don't know, um, was probably something omnivorous, right? That would kind of make, or carnivorous even, that probably makes sense. So I'm not su super surprised by that. Um, Purgatorius is an early, it's, it's so primitive that like it's probably a stem primate. Um, and you have to remember that like, you know, Kalugos and rodents also probably all those guys rodents kalugos or the ancestors of kalugos the ancestors of primates all probably would have looked very similar at that time so while the thinking is generally purgatorius is probably a primate it could be like a stem rodent or something you know these are all fairly close at that time it's they like when you go back in time different members of what are today very very distinct lineages look more and more similar it's wild. Wouldn't that be Weird. like the case if evolution were true or something? Yeah, it's sort of a prediction of the idea of, of common ancestry. Interesting. Very interesting. So. Uh, we also have Barry Lambda, which is a pantodont. Pantodonts, I think those were also ungulates, I think. They were like the first... Dap, can you look that up? I have forgotten. Uh, they were a group of... They were like one of the first larger uh, herbivorous mammals in the uh, in the Paleocene, or in the Cenozoic, I should say. So they attained relatively large sizes fairly early on. Oh, nope. I'm not dealing with that. He's they a creationist. He's, he's just going. Uh, oh! He doesn't know the difference between a time zone and a geological epoch. Oh, that's nope. cute. He's gone. Bye bye. Aww. I'm not dealing with that. Um, I was going to wait until he called people names again. Do you say he they're, they're simulestids? Yes. Okay, so that whoa, they're way out there. Um, so remember, si simulestids like fall outside of. Yeah, they're not placentals. Like, they're not even placental mammals. Yeah, they're they're way out there. Mm -hmm. So that's pretty cool. So that's one of those groups. Uh, so we have this. Yeah, this group that's you know not closely related to anything alive today, which you know, 
they had their own radiation. They did fairly well. So, what are you going to say? I was just going to say they do nest closer to um, placental mammals than they do to marsupials. So, yeah, they branch after the split between uh, metatherians and eutherians, and they're they're on the eutherian side of that, but they are outside of actual placental mammals. Right, and also the earliest, the early like simolestids also look like little shrews. You Which, know, by the way, crazy. also means that their lineage probably diverged sometime in the Cretaceous. Right. Right. Yeah. Not the Eocene. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, it's just so stupid, I can't oh. let it go. <laughs> no, you're right. It's, it's almost as stupid is, as asking what time zone the dinosaurs died in. The, <laughs> um, the thing about that, the paper... so. Meyer, when he said that, was referencing a paper that he co-authored with Gunter Beckley, who, while he is an invertebrate paleon, or you know, who, yeah, he is an invertebrate paleontologist. He knows better. So, even though vertebrates are not his specialty, he definitely knew better. Meyer oh, yeah. can maybe get away with it because he has nothing in terms of paleontology or biology as a background, but Gunter Beckley cannot get away from that. He definitely knew better, and that means he just lied. So. Well, it, it's, it's it's sort of like this, right? Just because you're a vertebrate paleontologist doesn't mean you can get away with saying like, oh yeah, Opabinia, that's from the Permian. No. Right. No one thinks that. You you wouldn't make that kind of claim without getting some kind of like double checking. It certainly wouldn't pass through real peer review because nope. um, they're going to send your more than one kind of paleontologist. Right. Yeah, they're even like micro paleontologists, which is pretty cool. You get to study like foraminifera and that sort of stuff. That's the kind of thing they make you do if you're under five feet tall. You go into paleontology. <laughs> you have to go into micro paleontology. You have to be this it. tall to study dinosaurs. <laughs> I could I could definitely see that as like gatekeeping paleontologist, the, the controversy you <laughs> never hear about because it's such a well kept secret, you know. <laughs> um also it's really hard for the micro paleontologists to win the snake fight at the end of their uh, PhD defense, the dissertation defense. <laughs> Yeah, because in case you guys don't know, you have to fight a snake at the end. It's a real. It's like it's basically Titanoboa. Is what well, it, it varies by school, and they usually keep more than one snake, right? But how big the snake is and how venomous it is depends on how much they liked your uh, your your paper that you're submitting. So I mean, like if if they really liked it, do you just have to fight like a corn snake or something? Yeah, it's like oh, this is a little like garter snake or a corn snake, and then if they really hate it, they're like, hey, this is a black mamba. Good luck. Right. <laughs> that's why the creationists never never really make it because they always get sent against the black mambas. That's that's why it's hard for them to get their PhDs in, in ontology. Hey, if one guy can like you know successfully keep a green mamba for extended periods of time, then I don't know. He's not fighting it. That's I mean that's true. He he handles it regularly. You know, I guess. But if he tried to punch it, I bet it would, <laughs> it would bite him. <laughs> Tired of you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, he bit me. Oh, no time to run to the hospital because there's no cure. <laughs> it doesn't matter how much time you have to run to the hospital. <laughs> Hospital's not going to help, man. You're done. Yeah. All right. Uh, anything to add on these uh, sundry mammals? Uh, just that, that mesonychid uh, sagittal crest really, really, really makes me not want to ever be bit by one. Because my goodness, would that be a strong bite? Yeah, I mean, look at those freaking canines. Good lord. <clears throat> yeah, things are horrifying. Yeah, yeah so he would uh, he would not be fun to mess with. So, mm -hmm. next slide, please. Yeah, early ungulates. Hooray! Hmm. So, yeah, here we go. Um, so Criacus is a a basal ungulate, and even though it looks like an like a little raccoon or something like that, like an um, some sort of little raccoonid um, is actually an early ungulate. And they know this because it has these little um, like whirls in its uh, its ear that are diagnostic of ungulates. But it looks like... I mean, it's plantar grade. Come on. Right. It's not even ungulate grade. <laughs> right. Uh, I mean, but he looks like, you know, maybe the common ancestor of, or maybe their common ancestor with like Carnivorans lived recently. Yeah, like they're it still does kind of look like a basal ferron, huh? Yeah, like they're they're still kind of diverging, like they've done that recently or something. 
I don't know, just a Weird. wild shot in the dark. Um, Ectoconus uh, is a uh, yeah, Paraptychidae. So that's another group of like very uh, basal ungulates. Uh, you know, certainly no, none are around anymore, but just kind of showing again this very, very basal ungulate uh, or stem ungulate. None are uh, around that we know of. Apology. You never know. If, if the Congo can hide a sauropod, <laughs> it can hide anything. That's true. Yeah, maybe they're on like some, you know, Pacific Island or something. We just haven't, no one's hit it yet. So that reminds me, I, I made a video, it's not out yet, but this guy was like, no one lives in this swamp in the Congo. I'm like, well, what about these people? And then like 10 minutes later, he's like, well, except for these people who live there. <laughs> like, so it's not an uninhabited swamp, is it? Well, the thing I love about the Congo is like, researchers go there every year like lots of researchers go to the congo every year to study a variety of organisms you know whether plants or i actually worked for a professor who studied bats in the congo nice. so he went there um <clears throat> the idea that just nobody goes there except like you know a couple people and they take very grainy far off photos of things <laughs> like nah the nah. whole area is just a bl big black box for all of humanity nope Nope. Mm -mm. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, then Hyopsidus is an early, <clears throat> well, both Hyopsidus and uh, Phenacodus are both early perissodactyls. Um, it's kind of hard. I, I have like a hard time finding like very early, like Paleocene uh, artiodactyls. Don't know why uh, that because, is. <clears throat> it's, it's because the perissodactyls were doing better. They were more diverse. Yeah, I guess. Yeah. It's sort of like yep. the reverse of what's what's going on today, where Parasodactyla is, it's on its last legs, guys. Sorry, Artiodactyla <laughs> is, uh, it's not going anywhere anytime soon. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. There are lots of, there were lots and lots of different little sort of stem ungulate or stem Parasodactyl groups at this time, all doing their own stuff. And look at that long tail, like turning into gorilla sloth horses. Gorilla sloth horses. That's. You know That's exactly what I mean. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm pretty sure I mentioned them later on. Good. Uh, so, anything you guys will know when we get to the gorilla sloth horses. <laughs> yeah. Oof. Yes. It will be very obvious. <laughs> um, no, I think I'm good on this sec section. Okay. <clears throat> I've been taking this right. into enough tangents already. All right. And here we have <clears throat> just another look. At the Paleocene Eocene uh, thermal maximum. So, this is, yep, polar ocean uh, equivalent. So, this is temperature at, on one side, and then you have yeah, millions of years ago, and you have uh, dissolved oxygen on the other side. So, as you can see, um, so we are on uh, the, the bottom right of that graph, and the Paleocene and the PETM is up there, sort of near the top left. I think it was a little bit warmer than it is today. That's just my guess. <clears throat> Seems to be the case. Yeah. Although we are rapidly uh, approaching warmer times with our use of fossil fuels. So Hey, look, according to this graph, that was called an optimum. So I don't see what the big deal is. I Fair enough, I guess. Yeah, it was um, optimal for the temperature, <laughs> I guess. Yeah, so, I mean, let's, let's kick it into high gear, man. Let's get to that optimum, right? Yeah. No, this is sarcasm, by the way, guys. That's not actually <laughs> my position. I think. Okay. So also, I, I know I, I know I sent this uh, to you. You saw it. Um, I saw a book recently that is titled "The Moral Case for Fossil Fuels." Yeah. And the argument of this book is we should continue using fossil fuels because one, environmental damage not really that bad, guys. I don't don't overblow it. Uh, and the second thing is, well, some people are happy right now. So. Look, if you want to make a moral case for fossil fuels, you can do it. That's just not the way to do it. Here, here's the, <laughs> right. here's how you do it, right? <clears throat> there are currently people right now who are suffering and in many cases dying because they do not have access to sufficient high-density energy sources that right. they can use to improve their lives. And it is a big question whether or not you can morally justify continuing the suffering of these people because of hypothetical future people who do right. not currently exist. That's the moral argument for fossil fuels. Now, there are lots of counters that I can give, like 
there are other options to help alleviate that suffering, or while it might be okay for those people to increase their fossil fuel use, that's a relatively small portion of the human population as a whole who are in that situation. There's a whole lot of counters, but that's the way you make the moral argument in favor of fossil fuel use. If you point out current suffering that can be alleviated by fossil fuels, and then you point the, out the fact that hypothetical future people have less moral standing than currently existing suffering people. It's right. really not that hard. You don't have to lie about climate change. All right. But you do have to deal with the fact that there are going to be good counters. So, you know, it's almost like being some kind of moral philosopher isn't just really easy. Right. Yeah, exactly. Hence why I don't do uh, moral philosophy on this channel. So here we go. <laughs> you do it off the air. Right. I'm just here to make Jackson laugh. I don't believe that that is the case. I think that's called a lie. Um, what? Let's have something else. Oh no. Uh, oh no. So all of you, no, no one is free from sin. Oh. Okay. Oh my goodness. Uh, <laughs> I, I'm not going to comment on sin <laughs> during our history of life on Earth. Um. All right. Next slide, please. <laughs> so the Eocene, we have reached the Eocene. Yay! Woo. Finally, the dawn of mammals. <laughs> the mam the very first, so after like Dimetrodon died off in the Permian, there were no mammals, <laughs> no synapses, period, for the entirety of the Mesozoic. And then in the Eocene, the first mammals dropped <laughs> from heaven itself. They just, you know. God was like, Bam! Giraffe. <laughs> Time to make some shrews for reasons. I don't know. I don't care. <laughs> lots and lots of shrews. <laughs> um, so, uh, so some interesting things were happening in this time period. Uh, climatically, or well, geologically, which caused climatic changes, which then caused evolutionary and ecological changes. Kind of cool how everything's sort of like all dependent on other things that happen. It's almost like things happen and impact other things. Jackson, biogeography was invented by Satan to test your faith. <laughs> well, Satan won. Sorry. <laughs> uh, <laughs> he wrote his books on on finches are too good. I couldn't. Uh, <laughs> God's got to do better. <laughs> God's got to do better. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> God's going to write the, the tell all on like flatworms and Jackson's going to be right back to theism. Right. Yeah, I mean, he knows what would convince me, so that's all I'm saying. Uh, so, so India was actually connected to Africa, and this was the case for, like, most of the Mesozoic, um, mm -hmm. and pretty, most of the Paleozoic, too, right? Um, I believe so, but I'm honestly not as confident about that. Well, at any rate, most of the Mesozoic, we'll just say that. So India was attached to Africa. It was part of Gondwana, along with South America, Africa, Madagascar, uh, Australia, and Antarctica. And uh, Oh, wait, India... we forgot to talk about the Planocranids. Oh, crap, you're right. Go ahead. Do it. Okay, Planocranidae. It's a group of... They're not quite crocodilians. They're crocodile forms. So they're close to modern crocodilians, but they're not quite in that group. They had hooves. They might have actually walked on their the tips of their toes, like like, you know, cows and horses and whatnot. And they ran across the land in Asia, Europe, and North America to hunt down terrestrial mammals, and they were covered in armored plates. And they're horrifyingly awesome. Some some that you might want to look up if you're interested are Bovarosuchus, Durosir, well, Duerosuchus, Duerosuchus, there you go, and Planocrania. And now that's Suchus with S-U-C-H-U-S, so like B-O-V-E-R-I-C-U-H-U-S. Duerosuchus, D-U-E-R-O-C, or sorry, S-U-C-H-S, and Planocrania, P-L-A-N-O-C-R-A-N-I-A, -A Planocrania. Planocranids, awesome. There's still a whole bunch of really cool reptiles going on at during the, uh, the Paleocene. It's very, very neat. Absolutely. That I can agree with. All right. Uh, back to the easy. No, no, sorry. no, no, no. No, it was a good. It was a good point. There are some cool uh, crocodilians, crocodilomorphs, crocodiliformes. Uh, cro crocodiliforms. I just, I just double checked. Crocodiliforms. Um, 
So yeah, so India detached from Africa and for its own personal uh, tectonic reasons. Who like we it just wasn't working out when they needed a break. Right, exactly. And and who can blame them, honestly, after being attached yeah. for like over 100 million years? You know, I'd, I'd probably want a break too. You know, what can you say? Yeah, Africa was getting a little possessive and Asia looked like a good time. So yeah, and so we just left. made a break for it. <laughs> yeah. Um, and by making contact with Asia, pushed up these mountains like no one's ever heard of, called the like the Himalayas or something. You, you probably haven't heard of them. They, they don't really matter. Um, yeah, I think they but, make salt lamps there or something. Yeah, so, something like that. Um, and, but as a result, this brought the uh, the, the temperature of or the or the atmospheric temperature down because, um, as we discussed before, um, major erosion events tend to suck carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. And so this um, coincided with like the cooling of Antarctica, which had also detached from uh, uh, the other pieces of, of Gondwana. Yeah. And so uh, South America, Australia, all those guys. And so now it's, you get these, these currents circling um, South America, which are or, South, South America, Antarctica, which are not going back up to the equator. They're just circling Antarctica, so they're they're cold and they're staying cold, and this is helping bring the temperature of Antarctica down. And that's still what, what I'm hearing is that the real solution to climate change is just pushing India even harder into Asia. <laughs> we're, gonna, I mean, we're gonna get those catastrophic plate tectonic guys to work their magic, but only around India. I mean, after all, um, Rodinia, or yeah, sorry, um, was it Rodinia? No, no, Rodinia was after. Um, the cryogenian glaciation happened because the, maybe it was Rodinia. I think it was Rodinia was in like, was in the entirety of like our continents were in equatorial regions, which was doing major erosion and majorly pulled down the climate. Um, so yeah, just push all of our continents down to the equator. They'll get like eroded and then boom, snowball earth again, just like we like it. Nice and chilly. Yeah, actually I'm going to pass on that one. <laughs> you don't want snowball earth big sad look i intentionally moved to the hottest inhabited region of the united states because <laughs> it was the hottest inhabited region of the united states yes um so that happened i think weren't like um i think a large portion of of um like horse and rhino evolution occur has occurred like in India and stuff like that, which is kind of neat. Well, um, I mean, it starts in North America and then right. it goes across into Eurasia, and then a lot of stuff happens down mm. in, um, like Central Asia and India, and then they start getting into Africa, going mm. extinct in North America, and then some weird, bald, sweaty apes end up like taming some of them mm. twice. Yeah. It's very nice. weird. Um, some some darn monkeys also rafted from Africa to South America. They were called the Platyrrhines. That happens. Yes. Um, now, as you can, oh, go ahead. I was going to say, now, one thing is that um, at this time, you can just see it on the map that Africa and South America are significantly closer yes. at this point. So this is not the kind of thing that we're likely to see happening again. Also, rodents made the same trip. Yeah, um, and I think a couple other like small vertebrates made it, but yeah. Yeah, so that is one of the things where, like, nowadays, I've heard some people who reasonably say, that seems like an implausibly long trip. Mm -hmm. It's like, today, yes, that would be implausibly long. And it's still a very rare thing, even during the Eocene, when they're much, much closer, but at least it's yes. possible in the Eocene. Right. Um, but also, fun fact, um, primates made the trip to South America, not once, but twice. A second uh, rafting event was found to have occurred in South America with the discovery of a little primate called Eukaea lepithecus. So but they didn't are, last, huh? They did not last, apparently. <clears throat> but yeah, what it that's... shows is that, like, I mean, yeah, was it difficult? Yes. Was it impossible? No. And it mm -hmm. happened at least twice, possibly even more times, because, I mean... You know, if you're if you're a small vertebrate and you live in trees and maybe a storm breaks that tree 
and you raft for like a couple days and that's all it takes to reach like South America by rafting. That's not terrible odds. Yeah, you, you have a fair chance of making it. Yeah, it's, it's not the worst odds in the world. So plus a lot of small mammals also will, will like slow down their metabolism uh, in like rough times for different things, for different reasons. So yeah, yeah, not not impossible. Um, then yeah, Antarctica detached from South South America and Australia by the end of the period and began cooling. So the cool thing is Australia and, and South America were sort of indirectly attached to each other via Antarctica. And so for a while, researchers were trying to figure out where the like early, um, uh, where the marsupials, the, yeah, the early marsupials who were ancestral to the Australian marsupials came from. Did they and ancestral them? to the South American marsupials? Because there's still extant mars marsupials that are native in South America. Well, right, like they were in South America originally. The question was, did they get to Australia via Africa or Antarctica? So mm -hmm. they predicted, or well, then they did more geologic research and they realized, okay, Africa detached way too early, so it seems unlikely they rafted like twice. Yeah. Um, so it was probably more likely that they just walked across Antarctica and made it eventually to Australia. So you so could say they predicted. They predicted. Oh, okay. Yeah, they, they made a, a prediction about where and when some fossil marsupials would be. And now hold up. Hold on. All right. Okay. So now are predictions on their own the gold standard of science? I'm just double checking. On their own? Yeah. I mean, they're they're pretty if darn I just good. Make a prediction. If I just make a prediction, is that the gold standard? No, no. You just no. make one up. Just you know, throwing darts through the air. No. What makes it the gold standard? If it is backed up by data. Okay. Beforehand. Okay. I'm just double checking. So what happened in this case? So they had their geologic data, which indicated that Africa had moved away too, you know, too early. And we had fossils on both ends, South America, obviously, and Australia. And so the only logical route that seemed to present itself would be Antarctica in the Eocene before it had detached. So they said, hmm, let's search some early Cenozoic strata in Antarctica. And Dapper, do you want to guess what the researchers found? Um, The remains of the great flood of noah well you are wrong no oh, damn it wait was it was it uh early marsupial fossils it was actually the tower of babel they were wrong the whole time about where it was oh gee that's really off <laughs> they did in fact find earlier early marsupials and monotremes found both of them in antarctica shocking uh, i know big shook uh <laughs> Well, big shook if you're if you don't subscribe to evolution. I'm you know. literally shaking right now. <laughs> yep, novel testable predictions, as JG points out, mm -hmm. that then turn out to be supported. That's the key little bit right there. Yep, yeah, that actually panned out. Yep, he just wrote the same thing. Yep, so exactly right. That's it's really great when that happens because it shows like we're probably on the right track. Maybe not yeah. everything is correct, but we're at least on the right track. It's, it's hard to be broadly correct. Or sorry, it's hard to be mostly wrong while getting repeated predictions correct. Gen right. It tends to be if you can repeatedly predict future data, you're at least mostly right. Right, exactly. And in this case, it, I, you know, I don't think any major conclusions about this have been overturned. So anyway, anything you want to add? No, I think I've covered everything I want to. All right. Next slide, please. Afrotheria. <laughs> so these are some Eocene Afrotheres. Uh, and Afrotheres, like, so you guys remember from a few slides ago, unless you have, like, Dory memory, in which case you should probably get that checked out. Unless you forget that I just said that, in which case, they you will. Know, who cares? <laughs> um the ants the you know this guy who way preceded everybody else in Africa theory was a little shrew like guy there were no um he didn't have a trunk he didn't have big horns he just just a little shrew like dude 
But now by the Eocene, you have had some, uh, there's been some radiation in Africa because the Afrothairs were kind of it for African uh, mammals. Um, so you had elephants who were evolving in, well, originally elephants evolved in a semi-aquatic habitat, which makes sense because their closest relatives, the, the ancestors of Serenians, were also Evolving in semi-aquatic habitats, huh? Strange how that happens, but anyways. Weird. And I weird. seem to remember their skeletons being very similar. They are, especially the, the hip region for both Merotherium and Pedzosiren has been compared, and researchers uh, were like, these are very similar in terms of gait. So... Hmm. It's like another instance of now quite distinct lineages, and you look in the past of their earliest representatives, they are much, much more similar them than they are today. Oh, no, that's, that's bonkers. Yeah, I'm just going to keep pointing that out, by the way, because it's <laughs> very consistent and very obvious. Yeah, there are some strange people out there who um, don't seem to get that. But anyways. Yeah, weird. There were also some cool Afrothairs who looked sort of like rhinos, but and uh, just weren't. Um, I think the way, what was it? Uh, like, the Nigel Marvin documentary where he like went back in time to he like went to the Cretaceous and saw mosasaurs and went to uh, the the Paleozoic and saw like Eurypterids and Cetacanthus and Dunkleosteus. That... Do you remember the name of it? Because I can't remember the name. I it sounds familiar, and I'm pretty sure I've seen it, but no, I do not know the name. Mm. Anyway, um, didn't he uh, swim in like a shark cage with Dunkleosteus? He did. Yes, that happened. Yeah, then, then I'm definitely remembering the same uh, docu series that you are. Yeah. Um, and Dunkle Osteus acted exactly like he like was like, white. let me go, let me go, let's take a look, see over here what's happening. <laughs> um, so the way he described uh, our Arsino Ethereum, uh, was looks like a rhino, uh, behaves like a hippo, but related to elephants, which, yeah, yeah, yeah. I wonder if it tastes like an elephant. I, do you do you know what elephant tastes like? Maybe. Okay, interesting. Um, so yeah, also seem to be semi-aquatic. Um, so technically, all three of these guys are in a group called Tethytheria. So they were probably paddling around on the coast of the Tethys Sea, uh, which still took up basically like the Mediterranean and like part of uh, Southeast Asia, or sorry, part of Southwest Asia, and then like Southern Europe. So the Tethys Sea was sort of that area, and so. The on the southern end, basically, you had the Afrothairs paddling around, and on the northern end, you had the early cetaceans paddling around. So, cool stuff. Everybody's testing out new stuff. So, uh, anything you want to add? Uh, just that Smitty says it tastes like mammoth. Well, jokes on you. Mammoths were elephants. <laughs> yeah, it tastes like. Oh, so you <laughs> mentioned you mentioned uh, this the the gorilla sloth something that you're going to get to. We're not there yet. No, no, no. Gorilla can, sloth yes. horse. Can, we're, can, we're not there yet. Yeah. Can can I? Uh, so, Peso Siren. Could, couldn't we call that the 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 pit bull hippo seal? Because once you see I'm, it, I'm you, here for it. You yeah. can't you can't unsee it. Yeah, I'm here for it. Yeah, I, I say it's a good idea. It's fine by me. Okay. Pitbull hippo seal. Yeah. Yes. Okay. That's that's going to be in the literature now. Yeah. <laughs> Pitbull hippo seal. Okay. I got a mention. Next slide, please. I'll I'll get a mention in my next <laughs> in the next book then. Okay. <laughs> oh, here we are. The early artiodactyls. <clears throat> so, like I said, uh, these guys start really diversifying in the Eocene. We got Diacodexus and Elamerix. I, if I remember correctly, I could be wrong, but I think Elamerix is near like the hippos. If I remember correctly, I could be wrong. Um, Archaeotherium is a member of the uh, Intellidonts. So the Intellidonts were these, or another group of these big toothy um, ungulates. Like, thank goodness we don't have big carnivorous ungulates running around anymore. Yeah, it's sort of like. Imagine if a pig were the size of a, a large horse. And, you know, pigs are, are omnivores. They'll eat all mm. sorts of things. They'd eat you if you were small enough. Right. Yeah, and you absolutely. would be small enough if you were to meet an Antelodont. 
<laughs> right? Yeah, these guys um, are also, I think, I think they nest just outside the whale hippo clade. Whippamorpha. One of the best named clades. See, you get great stuff like Whippamorpha, and then you ruin it with things like Cetardia Dactyla or Pen Crustacea. Get well, out of here, guys. Maybe, uh, I don't know which one was first, but maybe they did like set Artiodactyla and then redeem themselves with uh, Whippamorpha. They were like, we're sorry, taxonomy gods. We offer as tribute Whippamorpha. <laughs> maybe. That's what I'm going with. That's my story. Anything as like Smitty, does point out that, well, Smitty does point out that we have uh, big boars. And yes, huge boars are in fact quite dangerous to humans. However, they don't actively hunt humans. <laughs> I feel like Antelodons would have. Yeah, no, I don't think they would have passed up a human <laughs> if given yeah. the opportunity. Um, all right, next slide, please. All right, whales, another group of artiodactyls that are definitely not set artiodactyls. <laughs> they are uh, cetaceans, though. They That's are funny. cetaceans, whatever rank that occupies nowadays. Maybe some all, who knows. Ranks, all the ranks are just made up nonsense. It's true. That's true. They, are just they mean nonsense. literally nothing. So, Which is why it's so odd to say that separate ancestry stops at one of them. Yes, it does. It's it's very, very weird when people say, like, common ancestry goes only up to the family. But, like, you either have 100,000 members in your family or just one. Yeah, and like, especially doesn't... since family doesn't really mean anything. Yeah, it doesn't. There's nothing. It doesn't say anything about your genetics, about your behavior, your ecology, your morphology. Literally nothing. Doesn't even say anything about your divergence time. Nope. Nothing at all. It's it's a completely made up thing that humans invented, and then some. Some group of humans are like, this might actually be some kind of significant real thing about reality. It's nope. it's like as if some humans decided that, hey, you know what? Maybe the word whale is actually the intrinsic thing that the universe calls these whales. Like, yeah. No, you just happen to speak English. That's dumb. <laughs> right. Um, so, whales are a pretty cool group um, because they underwent some very radical evolutionary transformations in a relatively short period of time, like about 10 million years. Mm -hmm. They went from being pretty much fully terrestrial to pretty much fully aquatic. And that's yeah. pretty cool. Um like they they went super extreme with a lot of their specializations, uh, much more so than like you know we met the placodonts, or placodonts, however you pronounce it, um, in a previous episode, and they just kind of evolved like you know they got some paddles and, and stuff like that, which is cool and all. It's all real nice and kick out shells. Yeah, some of them got some really cool shells, but you know these guys like they can't move on land at all today. They just mm -hmm. can't, um, and so. The well, to be fair, early... ichthyosaurs went through similarly extreme adaptations, although right. they took they longer did. to do it. Right. I don't actually even know what the timeline is for, like, what for ichthyosaur evolution. I mean, you know, you see the... So our see... earliest Triassic ichthyosaurs are definitely things that could still move around on land if they had to, although they would be awkward like a sea turtle. But I mean, like, in terms of time period. Um. So it took them... A... I had to double check, but I feel like it was somewhere close to around, like, half of the Triassic to go from, like... Okay. Fully terrestrial to like, no, you're not coming back on land and you are obligate uh, oviviviparous rather than just okay. oviviparous. <laughs> For those of you who might not be familiar, oviviviparous means that you retain the egg inside of the female's body and it hatches in there and then it is released from the reproductive tract. Yeah. And uh, yeah. it looks like they were probably oviviviparous. Although, look, reptiles are currently independently evolving a placental style uh, reproductive system in a few lizards. So, like, mm -hmm. is that impossible for ichthyosaurs? No, no, it's not. Also, um, uh, viviparity in um, in lizards is also correlated with having like specific endogenous retroviruses, which is kind of cool. Hmm. What does that say about like or uh, amniote evolution as a whole? Hmm. Well, we do in fact know that um, some of the genes re involved in placental reproduction are in right. fact neo-functionalized ERVs. Mm -hmm. So, right, like um, the sensitin um, genes are definitely refunctionalized uh, ERVs. Like, yeah. there's no question at this point. They are Basically, definitely were viruses and are not doing 
their original virusy things anymore. Yeah. So viruses have a tendency to make various things that help suppress your immune system, mm -hmm. which is also a handy thing to do if it just so happens that your <coughs> sorry your reproductive strategy involves you sharing tissue with a growing fetus. Mm-hmm. Because uh, that's the kind of thing that your body would normally tend to just absolutely target and destroy, which <laughs> right. does still happen. I mean, that is a cause of miscarriages in placental right. mammals. But um, the fact that placental mammals manage to actually have this as a successful reproductive strategy means that they have to, to some degree, suppress the immune system in pregnant females. And the genes that are used to do that are, in fact, derived from viral genes. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep, yep, yep. Um, it should also be noted, nobody ever suggested that, like, all... Um, ERVs or all junk DNA as a whole were like always non-functional and could not be refunctionalized. That was never a thing anybody suggested. <clears throat> well, so it's some, really weird. It's something, it's something some non-experts have suggested. Okay, I'm sorry. Let me rephrase. It's it's something no experts ever suggested. No geneticists ever said all junk DNA is just totally Trash. useless. Get rid of can it. never be used again. Like, nope. Mm -hmm. That's not a thing they ever said. So stop lying. Please. Thank you. Um, so I, was say, I like the, the intermediate nasal position for yes, Zygoriza. Yes, exactly. So, um, so your early uh, cetaceans like Indohias and Pachycetus, these guys are showing characters, uh, including like their um, ratios of particular isotopes that indicate they were living if you know almost entirely on land, but maybe like hunting, uh, in the water, perhaps. So they were like, those teeth are for catching fish, right? So they were eating fish, but they're doing it in fresh water. First of all, they're not doing it in salt water. <clears throat> and they are staying near shore. These guys are not paddling long distance. They also have the, 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 what, the nares, um, right? Uh, their nasal passages at the very end of their snout, like, you know, all terrestrial mammals at the very start of their evolution, but it starts moving progressively back. It's, it's in fact, called a uh, nasal drift. It's a well-documented and studied phenomenon. It's not the same so, as nasal drip. Nope. And uh, there's a group of protists <laughs> called drips, and uh, I don't think they can make your nose drip. I don't remember. But, uh, Do they live in the nose of anything? Uh, some of them are like fish parasites. Oh. I don't think. Also, any they're a group of what, Jackson? <laughs> Anyways, no, 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 you're not going to get away with this. To... There is no such thing as protists, Jackson. Oh, I told you I wasn't going to let you say it. You can't. You're not going to make me a liar, Jackson. <laughs> so, as whales became progressively more, um, more aquatic, their nose moved, their, their nasal uh, passage moved progressively further back on their head until now it's basically atop the head, it's above the eyes, essentially, and. They and so, you know, it's not functioning like noses originally did. They're not smelling things underwater <laughs> with that nose, um, because it turns out no. noses don't work super well underwater, at least for mammals. Don't work yeah, really well. cetaceans basically have lost all functionality of all their um, their genes associated with smell, with the exception of some mysticy have like a couple functioning smell receptors. <laughs> right. Yeah, they've even lost, like, the, I think the part of the brain that's involved in smelling. It's just, there's no need for it. There yeah, just isn't. They can't use it. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, yeah, Pachycetus up there. So, the cool thing about Pachycetus is does not look very whaley. But, mm -hmm. Pachycetus has the unique inner ear structure of whales. He's got a little bone called an involucrum and a couple, like, other little um, factors in it, which um, assign it to uh, cetaceans but the the easiest thing to remember is like the involucrum <clears throat> he also has a lot of like dental characters and cranial characters in common with like basilosaurus um so there's that too but he also has the unique uh artiodactyl ankle bone or uh, ankle shape ankle bone shape for astragalus for the the astragalus so he's got this unique artiodactyl ankle joint ankle bone and then a unique whale uh, in her ear. So that pretty conclusively puts whales in the artiodactyls. Pretty conclusively. 
So um, if you like read maybe people who don't believe that whales are descended from artiodactyls, that's never really their argument. Like the actual, they, they just don't even try with the morphology. They're like, the transition is too fast. They yeah. try to throw the waiting time problem at you, which is not a problem. Mm -mm. Sorry, it's dumb. Um, also, the waiting time problem is contradicted by some of their other points that they try to make, like creative yes, heterozygosity. Yes, it is. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Mm -hmm. Can't have it both ways. <laughs> yep. Get a pick. Um, Sorry that you need both. Right. Yeah. You got to invoke like two new arguments to attack just one. So, yeah. Mm. Sorry. Yeah. Two mutually contradictory arguments. Um, and so, Zygariza. As you can see, both the the hind limb, the hind limbs definitely are highly reduced. You can see them just like little little bits back there, you know, attached uh, by like metal to the rest of the the skeleton there. So little itty bitty. They're not. He's not using those to walk around anymore. Um, but uh, uh, basilosaurids were still using their hind limbs to uh to mate interestingly they were used as claspers sort of like how sharks use theirs today and, and rays so. presumably it's a little speculative there right i i happen to think that's probably what they function in i mean yeah, I also think, they were still you know on the way out clearly yeah. but you know and what here's one interesting thing i i have heard some people claim that the fact that the bones identified as uh pelvic bones in modern whales are mm -hmm. involved in reproduction is an indication that they are in fact not vestigial pelvic bones. But uh, here's a here's a quick hint for those of you who are unfamiliar with uh, mammal reproductive strategies. Um, the pelvic bones are intimately involved in most reproductive strategies of most mammals. Mm -hmm. So the fact that they retained that secondary function while losing the locomotor functions doesn't really indicate that it's not a vestigial pelvis. Just a pro tip for any of you out there who might be hearing that argument. Which also, I think it's a good time to point out, uh, vestigial, as we, we pointed out in the evolution process series, never meant totally functionless. Correct. That's not a thing that it means or meant. So there are some people who, in, in like popular works, for instance, who will say vestigial means functionless. And technically, you can find uh, examples of things that are essentially functionless. Like, like uh, the erector pili muscles for humans? Yep, that's one. Uh, we also mentioned the uh, the auricular muscles uh, behind the ear or around the ear, um, because it's they're not helping. They're they're not doing their job in like turning your ears towards sound. They're just not. Yeah, even humans you are can, super bad at that. <laughs> right. Yeah, even if you can wiggle your ears like cool, but that's it's not really doing much yep. for us as a species. Little so. little like party tricks aren't normally what we're talking about when we mean function. Right. Yeah. So whales are pretty cool. Um, they're neat guys. Uh, have anything you'd like to add? Um, just that, uh, sorry guys, we can't rename Bacillosaurus every once in a while. I get asked about this. <laughs> the first name that's published for an organism is the one that has to kind of stick in terms of generic names. So, even though, yes, I know that Bacillosaurus is not a king lizard, it is in fact a whale. No Zulodon, sorry. Yeah, there's nothing anyone can do about it. And in fact, yeah, I hear Aaron Ra complain about that a lot. I think Aaron Ra would like to rewrite the rules of taxonomy to get rid of priority, but like, dude, that would mean chaos. Sorry, we can't do that. that. Yeah, no, that would it'd be bonkers. Yeah. But uh, yeah, Zuglodon was like a fun little name that uh, uh, some basil sword specimens had for a while. But yeah, sorry, they got, they got reanalyzed and referred to the Basilosaurus genus. It's not even as bad as freaking Indricotherium, which also is like Paraceratherium and Baluchotherium. It just how many names it had in yeah, the literature. Yeah, that whole that whole complex. I'm not even sure which one has priority at this point. I think it's Indricotherium, I think. Okay. Well, it's too bad cuz I like Paraceratherium as a name, but whatever. You know what? Actually, look look it up. Uh we're going to go to the next slide and look that up, please. All right, awesome. Let's, let's be, be, next be, slide, please. Before we go to the next slide, let's stick to the names a little bit. So, um I think not enough people look at names and and actually see what it says. Are are you familiar with the um, the silver fox experiment, uh, Jax? I think I've heard of it once or twice. Yeah. Yes. Do, do you know what what happened there? What what they selected for? Uh, tameness, I believe. Exactly. Well, one group was selected for tameness. There was a right. less well known group that was uh, selected for aggressiveness. 
Yes. You don't right, hear well, about the, them as much because they're not as adorable. Yeah, they, <laughs> they, were, yeah. they were pretty aggressive, but the silver fox has mm. never killed humans. Whereas if we look at the top of the chart, there is an animal that is extremely dangerous uh, to, to human beings, which is still around, the hippo. Mm -hmm. And if I, so they should have done the experiment with the hippo because it literally says it in the name hippopotamus. Yep, the river horse. Yeah, hippopotamus. Ah, never mind. Wow. Wow. I get it. It's a pun. Slow clap. <laughs> By the way, uh, it is looking like Paraceratherium, in fact, has priority. Oh, okay. All right. Well, I mean, Which that is a cool go. name. It is, yeah. It also means that it's one of the few instances where Ark Survival Evolved took a stance on a contentious issue and got it right. <laughs> well, glad to hear it. You know, you love Look, to see... It's you a game I like it. to play, but it's completely absurd and off the wall. But I do notice that we are, in fact, getting a picture of a skeletal reconstruction of a gorilla sloth horse. Yeah, so we met... So if you guys remember, I hope, we met the early Perissodactyls a little while ago. And they did not look like rhinos or horses or gorilla... What did you say? Gorilla sloth, sloth horses? Sloth horses, yes. Yeah, or gorilla sloth horses. They look like weird little guys. Like kind of, some look kind of raccoony. Um, they had long tails, which there are not any persidactyls that have these long bony tails today. Mm -mm. Uh, so, but now we are starting to get um, more, slightly more familiar uh, looking forms. And also, as Dapper and I had discussed on more than one occasion, the earliest. Fossil horses and the earliest fossil rhinos are darn near identical, with the exception yeah. of their teeth. They're like molars. Even then, you still have to be an expert at the morphology of those teeth in order to distinguish them. When we say, like, that's the only way, it's not like there's a radical difference. There's tiny little minutiae in the way the cusps are formed that mean that this side is slight, the horses are slightly better at eating, like, grass, mm -hmm. and the rhinos are slightly better at eating, like, broad leaves and twigs. Yep. And other than that, they're essentially identical. Yep. Yep. They're just starting to um, hit on different niches, one being a, a browser, as Dapper said, one being a grazer. If you were to see them both alive, you might put them in the same family. Yeah. Possibly even the same kind. <laughs> yeah. Heck, I wouldn't even be all that surprised if people seeing them together at the same time were tempted to put them in the same genus. Right. Yeah, absolutely. I mean... Look, when you work with fish and you're like, okay, these look pretty similar. Oh, wait, this one has a black stripe on its back. Oh, God, it's a totally different family. <laughs> <laughs> um, I just maybe find out. And then you fish. get paddlefish and sturgeons hybridizing. So who cares? Yeah, no, it's all, all out the window. Um, so uh, a couple. So. Well, we'll get to the more famous groups in a moment. So a less famous group um, perhaps was the uh, the gorilla sloth horses um, Yay. called the Calicathers. Um, and, uh, Should I explain they... why I call them that? Go ahead. Have at it. So the thing is, on, on the one hand, they are, if you look at the skeletons, the, the bottom right skeleton on the left most uh, illustration here, they do have rather horse-like skulls in sort of the broad sense of very stereotypically parasodactyl type skulls. But then they are very, very long-armed, like a gorilla with very short legs. So their stance is very much like a modern gorilla. But then on their front limbs, they have these gigantic claws that look like the claws of a sloth. So, you know. Yeah, they're all, whack. They're extremely unusual, and uh, I wish they were still around because that would be wild yeah they're pretty cool um and so yep not around anymore big sad um and then we have I also slightly... you're going... go, ahead. Yeah. go ahead i was just say i know you're going for the the big horn interpretation of elasmatherium right now it's, it's just like a knob right Still well there. there's some there's been some pushback on the hypothesis it's not for sure at this point i i I put this together before that paper came out, so. And you didn't update it immediately. Look, if the, if the guy who made that picture did it, you know, updated it immediately, 
No, they just put like a censored on the horn because it's not the jury's not in. So, <laughs> um, you know, something like that. Uh, so also the evolution of the horse. So the evolution of the horse, interestingly, was used as like one of the first um, like public demonstrations of evolution in the deep time in, in the deep past. So um, Thomas Henry Huxley took, I think, I think basically all these guys like Heracotherium, uh, uh, Myohippus and uh, Merichippus, all those guys. And like, you know, he sort of put them in this sort of this line, basically, uh, which, of course, isn't the case. You can see that there's a lot of branches there and probably even more in the actual um, the actual family tree. Uh, horses were there. They, there wasn't just a this single line going from Heracotherium to today. There's lots and lots of branches, and it's all over the place. Um, but but so Huxley, he takes these. You know, he takes like their their hooves, their skeletons, because a bunch of these fossils were found in North America. So they were results of the Bone Wars between um, Marsh. Marsh, yeah, Marsh and Cope. And so, yeah, these guys are finding these fossils and Huxley is kind of takes them and he's like, all right, look at this. We got the whole, you know, a, a nice enough fossil series where we can show the evolution of these different characters. And that was pretty powerful. Yeah. And the thing is, even though the orthogenetic display that you sometimes see in like older textbooks or whatnot is, is not the full picture, it is the case that that is roughly the morphological sequence that you would expect to get right. from something like Hierarchotherium to Equus. So as long as you keep in mind the fact that it was not an orthogenic march of progress, then it's it's not entirely inaccurate to display this morphological sequence like we have going from bottom to top here. Right, exactly. So horses are cool, cool guys. And then the the story is you know sort of similar for rhinos. You have their your small sort of generalized herbivores who got progressively larger as time went on. And it just so happened that these guys had like a, like a keratin sheath over bone on their nose, which was it sexual display or, you know, for protection. Well, either way it got larger and larger. Uh, and now we have our rhinoceroses who, you know, I'm sure everyone is familiar with. And I believe the uh, evolution of these groups or the radiation of these groups is linked with like the opening of grasslands. Like as, as the Eocene climate was like drier or the, sorry, got towards the Oligocene was became drier and you had a reduction in like forests and opening of grasslands. And so you have these running, these large running mammals that were evolving. So this is the herbivore side. And of course you also had large running carnivores too cats and dogs and things like that who i'm pretty sure we we'll talk about in a little bit nice anything you'd like to add no I, I feel like i actually added a fair bit on this slide all right next slide please yay we get an actual reconstruction Ooh, from julio yeah. lacerda I, I like his art yes he is pretty cool i follow him on twitter he's he makes some really Same. nice artwork yeah check him out if you're on twitter if you have happened to have accidentally fallen into the purgatory that is Twitter, mm, look him goodness. up. <laughs> I hang out on, on Twitter with Purgatorium because it's so purgatory. <laughs> is uh, it Purgatorious? Did I get it wrong? Purgatorious. Uh, yeah, I, I, uh, US. Oh well. You know what? Anyway. Uh, gender is stupid Latin, so get rid of at least two of them. <laughs> uh, Purgatorium this is Purgatorious. <laughs> Sorry this is another... now, Mel. Right. All right. This I'll was stop. another um, like former ontogenetic uh, sequence, or orthogenetic sequence. I did it. Orthogenetic. There you go. Orthogenetic. Ontogenetic is development. This is not an ontogenetic sequence right here. It actually kind of looks like one though. Sort of, but uh, I I think um, the the guy at the Eo Titanops preceded these other guys in time. At any rate, um, so this was also used as an orthogenetic sequence uh, for anyone. Orthogenesis isn't just uh, about like, like each fossil thing is like directly ancestral to the other thing. It was it was tied up with some weird like ideas about animal essences. Like they they can't life stop. energy and yeah they can't ju they just can't stop once they get going evolving these structures. There's no way to stop them until they go extinct. Like yeah, it was like evolutionary momentum basically. 
Yeah, and that nah, nah, no, nah, that think. doesn't really work that way. Um, this yeah. was also so this picture actually came out in like the early 1900s. So you basically had a period called the Eclipse of Darwinism, and I don't remember if we talked about that in the evolution process. I don't series. believe we did. Um, but so Darwin was a major force in evolution when he came out with uh, Origin of Species and his other theories. Um, evolution was pretty much totally accepted by like most of the scientific community accepted evolution by the end of the 1800s. Yeah. Um, the problem was while basically everybody was on board with common ancestry, not everyone was on board with the mechanism. So uh, in like Britain, for instance, they were holding up you know, Darwin, of course, because he was their guy. But in France, there was a big re uh, resurgence of Lamarckism because Jean-Baptiste Lamarck was French. Uh, so he was their guy. And I think in America, Darwinism also went over fairly well. Um, to some extent, but then yeah. around like the time of the early 20th century, there was like, well, what about orthogenesis? Right, yeah. You had some paleontologists who... Um, I think Cope was one of them, wasn't he? Was he proposing? I'm not sure. Well, at any rate, um, so... Yep, so you had uh, some guys proposing orthogenesis, some guys... You had Lamarckism. Once Darwin died in... was 1882, I think. You had a resurgence of some of these other non-Darwinian um, evolutionary ideas. You had like saltationism. So basically evolution is proceeding by these huge mutational jumps. Crocodile also, lies an egg, duck pops out. Right. Yeah. And so all these different ideas were kind of all fighting. And it wasn't until the 1930s. So looking at research on like the, the early genetics research that had come out in the like the early 1900s or so, 19 aughts, teens, 20s, you have these researchers like Thomas Hunt Morgan and, uh, and guys like that, and they're all putting out these different papers. And then, then in the 30s, you get Ronald Fisher, JBS Haldane, Sewell Wright, and they're like, okay, this seems to be, or it seems to be that like evolution is largely natural selection acting on like minor variations over generations. And that won out because they provided mathematical models that explained it very well. And they incorporated like all the previous data that existed, which is yep. how science progresses. Yeah. You explain the data better. It's not just yep. that you can accommodate the data. Anyone can accommodate data. Mm -hmm. You have to both retrodict and predict the data better than anyone else. Yep. And so neo-Darwinism became the, uh, you know, the orthodoxy essentially in evolutionary biology in the 1930s. And then of course, later on you had other mechanisms added like non -Dar actual non-Darwinian mechanisms are a standard part of evolution nowadays, like um, mm -hmm. genetic drift into symbiosis, stuff like that. That's um, epigenetics is part of it now, you know, Evo Devo. So just more stuff added on top because evolution happens in a lot of ways. There's a lot Those of stuff like the going sprinkles on. on top of the, the banana sundae. Yep. I'm just hungry. Sorry. <laughs> that's that's all I I'm just hungry. Um so yeah. Anything else you want to add to the slide? Uh that baby calicotherium is adorable. He is adorable. Agreed. Next slide, please. There's also they follow like calicotheres in uh walking with monsters. No, walking with beasts. Sorry. Yes, in, uh, yes there is walking with beasts series. A also whole some intelligence. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Walking with monsters is fun. Look, walking with beasts, all the walking with are fun. However, yes. do remember that these are like what over a decade old at this point? Yeah, like early aughts, weren't they? Yeah. yeah so like mm -hmm. don't super trust everything that's in there, because not only was a whole bunch of it speculative at the time, we now know that a fair bit of the stuff that you're getting in there was not really true. But so, there is a new really cool one coming out in the next couple days. Mm -hmm. Which is like sort of based on the same sort of stuff, but obviously with modern reconstructions and modern data. Yes. So. If you were a fan of the Walking With series, um, now I can't remember the name of it, but it's on... Prehistoric Planet, isn't it? Yeah, Prehistoric Planet. It's on Apple Plus, and I certainly do not suggest that you watch it on Pirate. Don't sail the seven seas, everybody. You never cough. do that. Cough, yeah. cough, 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 Just cough, saying, cough, don't, cough. don't do that. You obviously have to pay those starving movie producers. <laughs> um, Jackson, they can't afford to gold plate their pool without you. I know. Uh, we should not tell anyone about F movies. Oops. Oh, oh I'm going to get I don't swatted. Know what that, I don't know what that is. That I don't is, know what that is. That sounds made up. Uh, anyways, 
Carnivora Morpha. So we're talking about outside the Carnivorans. So the, carni the Carnivorans. Carnivorans. These are stem Carnivorans. Exactly right. Yay. Um, now, uh, if there are any paleontologists, they might whack me for using like Measis, uh because... Yeah, I thought that was are... a crowned Carnivoran. Well, no, because I was going to say because there are lots of things which have been... Well, that's the thing. It's para... It's like paraphyletic. Measis uh, okay. has been assigned to things that are like not considered Measis anymore. Meacus? How are we? So I don't know. It was, don't just, it was a bit of a waste bin tax on, huh? Yeah, a bunch of things that were sort of weaselly, all living kind of around the same time and with, you know, better... With more fossils, better um, scanning, uh, you know, microscopes and all that sort of stuff. Turns out, no, not all of these are the same species or even the same genus. So, um, but so the carnivore morpha so, or is you know carnivorans plus their their stem relatives. Carnivora includes two modern clades, two extant clades, which is caniformes, the dog-like carnivorans, which is dogs, weasels, seals, bears. And then Spheloformes. Yeah, yeah, the, the weasel like Raccoons. guys. Um, and then if you're a coward, the Jews. also the, the red <laughs> man. <laughs> yeah, I literally they only exist if you're a coward, guys. Heads up. <laughs> if, you, if you don't know that reference, you can head over to my channel and watch uh, the, the first of my, no, the second of my Kurt Wise videos in which he says, oh, you know, some scientists are wimps or cowards and they put I literally... He said they put the red pen in its own family, but that's who cares? It's just like my goodness. <laughs> the thing, the thing that bugs me about Kurt Wise is PhD paleontologist man. Like he knows better than this. Oh, he, he definitely knows, knows better. better. Yeah, he knows why Lurida is a family. He should at least know why Antelocarpus is a family. <laughs> <sighs> yeah. Um. So. Uh. Oh, and then the the uh, Philoformes, which. Field formies get a lot less love. I mean, obviously, everyone's familiar with like Felidae, which are the cats, and also, um, yeah, I cannot Civets? remember. Well, I was thinking the the hyenas, I can't remember their family name though. Um, uh, yeah, but hyenas, hyenas, Civets? yeah, they yeah, there's um, like civets, and then you got like Binturongs and Fusa, ooh. and um, Man, other... you say Binturong and Fusa, and uh, my, my heart skips a little beat because they're so great, and no one knows they about are pretty them. Great. Right, yeah, also, give more love to those guys. Fun fact, Vinterong anal glands secrete a substance that smells kind of like buttered toast. That is a fun fact. I, I feel more fun having learned that fact. Now. Oh, beaver uh, oh, beer anal cats. glands. Beer cats are also in that group. Oh, yeah. Beaver anal glands smell vaguely of vanilla. And in fact, <laughs> it was used as vanilla substitute in the early 20th century in North America. Oh, it wasn't super popular. Uh, for... You know, reasons. In fact, artificial uh, vanilla flavor is the first artificial flavor ever developed. And it was developed specifically because neither uh, beaver anal glands nor actual bean vanilla were economically viable. <laughs> when the solution is just as bad as the cure. You know, right. Or sorry, the, the, the problem is just as bad as the problem. You know, so. Oh, a longstanding yeah. myth about beavers is that they will bite off their own testicles in order to escape uh, from hunters. This is not true. First of all, I had never heard that. So. Yeah, that that was a myth that persisted all the way into like the late medieval period, and it started way back in at least Roman times, where we have like depictions of beavers in Roman art uh, biting at their own scrotums. And the reason for this is that because the reason that beavers were hunted primarily at the time was in order to get secretions from their scrotum that were then used in perfumes, and are still used in perfumes actually. Gotta love it. Yay! People Jesus. put weird stuff on their body to smell better. I mean, is it is it much better than whale vomit, which is another thing that's still in perfume? Oh, no. Yeah. Or like, like a donkey urine, all that sort of stuff. Yeah, like, ugh. I don't get you it. You know how the Hyrax was named? How is it named? It was named after an ancient Roman medicine that they got from North Africa by scraping this, this crystally substance off of rocks. Yeah, it was dried Hyrax urine. Nice. Nice. Humans are doing all sorts of weird stuff with weird bits of animals. It's gross. Yeah. Um, yeah. We also do weird stuff in some places with like rhino horns and things, which are just bonkers mm -hmm. nonsense. So please don't kill rhinos and elephants to make yeah. medicine. Please don't do it. 
Your uh, ground up keratin from a rhino is not going to um, it's not going to make anything more erect than it used to be. <laughs> nope, you've taken something that was erect and turned it into powder. Yes, it's and it's just keratin. You would be just as well served grinding up your own hair and fingernails. Yep, yep. Um, so yeah, don't kill rhinos. Don't do that don't or do elephants, it, yeah. please. Yeah. Um. Then yeah, and there are like other, um, fila formies, but again, you, you know, like nobody really cares about the, the kivet like, um, fila forms except for you know things like the the meerkat because they're adorable. Everybody loves meerkats. Yeah, especially after um, the Lion King came out. And what was it like ninety three? Yeah, something like that. Um, and, but these guys are stem. They're you know stem to both caniformies and fila formies. So they nest outside the crown group. Got Domalision, Defon Defonus, and then Measis. And they all look kind of. Which kinda... is only kind of real. <laughs> kind of real, yeah. Uh, and all these guys look sort of weaselly, which yeah. early, like, dogs and cats also look sort of weaselly, or sort of civetly. Yeah, civets and weasels, and uh, to some extent, uh, Procyonids are sort of like the, the basal most in terms of morphology. Mm -hmm. of the extant carnivorans. They all look very similar. They all have kind of similar lifestyles. You might not think that with Procyonids if you're only familiar with the North American raccoon, but if mm -hmm. you look at Procyonids, which have like a much wider Oedo. diversity... Yeah, if you look at the South American, or um, the uh, Coatamundi, which does occur mm -hmm. in North America, but really only in Mexico and far southwestern United States. Like, you get it in New Mexico, Arizona, part, tiny parts of uh, California and Texas. But if you're familiar mm -hmm. with those animals, or the Kinkajou, which is yep. adorable. Um, and famously, uh, James Randi had a pet king, king Jew. Um, but <laughs> James yeah, Randy had a... he did. He had a pet, pet King Jew. Uh, they're adorable, and they look like little uh, weasel monkeys. And uh, yeah, if you look at those, you, you'll see that they're, yeah, they look a whole lot like, uh, especially like a Dormosion, which is a weird word that I can't say. Yeah, it is a weird our, word. Our boy on the bottom right. Dead boy. Yeah. Next slide, please. Promatis. Hey. Yes, that is definitely how it is pronounced. <laughs> uh, we got lots of Promatis in here. Uh, also, primates is the term for a group of Christian clergy. Oh, yeah, you're right. Yeah. 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 It it's interesting. because in both cases, they derived from the word for first. Primates are the first among mammals because... Well, they're the most human-like, uh, that's all it is. And then yeah. the, the primates in Christian clergy are the highest-ranking bishops in any given church. Nice. Because they're the first among those bishops. They're the prime primate, is what you're saying. <laughs> yes, they, they're double primates. Uh, Plesiodapus is another really early primate. Uh, it's from the Paleocene, super early dude. Is that um, North American? I feel like it is. Yes, it is North American. Okay. Yep. Because like many animals that no longer exist in North America natively, primates have first of all in North America. Yeah, uh, and then they yep subsequently went extinct over there, and they yeah North America and Europe yep, and then they uh, are o only are in well then they moved to Eurasia, mm -hmm. and then to Africa, and then some of them crossed over into South America, and now we got this one monkey that's just everywhere it's just all over the place yeah there is there is a particularly um high population monkey that has managed to spread to virtually every landmass uh, including antarctica because normally you say yep. oh it, it exists everywhere except antarctica nope 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 it's there too there there are monkeys in antarctica occasionally they're like at the bottom of the ocean too very occasionally, they're they're not intentionally there. and unintentionally. Yes, they're they're <laughs> transiently present at the bottom. Of the right. They're not they're not resident there yet. Not yet. Yeah, we you know until Cthulhu attacks our um our <laughs> deep sea bases. That actually reminds me. All, all the people who are like, oh, let's colonize Mars. It's like, look, man, it would be much easier to colonize the deep ocean. We haven't done that yet. So it yeah, it definitely would be. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, at least there's sufficient water down there. <laughs> Yeah, no, it doesn't does absolutely not involve like terraforming another planet yeah. to uh in the deep ocean. Yeah, there's a whole lot of steps that we need to go through before I think we're ready to colonize Mars. Yeah. Like absolutely. It is. 
Uh, like if, you, if you think the bottom of the Mariana Trench is hostile to human life, um, well, go to Mars. I got news. Way worse. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We got no, news for you, buddy. <laughs> yeah, and then then there's Techno Jesus, who's like, "No, it'll be fine. I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do it in 2020." Okay. Would some people just say he's a scammer? Oh, absolutely. Some people I, would say that. I feel like that's a thing people would say. If I'm if, not necessarily saying that, but some people would. I am. <laughs> I think he's just a scammer. Uh, Darwinius, you, you know what? We didn't get any any. Uh, Techno Jesus haters in the last video, so here we are again. <laughs> We're gonna keep doing it till we get like overwhelming hate responses. Uh, uh, Darwinius was a, a dare STEM... you insult Tesla Daddy. <laughs> um, um, Darwinius is a STEM strepsirine, also featured in Futurama, uh, in a conversation between Doctor Farnsworth and Doctor Banjo. So, yep. not entirely appropriately, but. Right. Well, it was there was some terrible press coverage of Darwinius when it was first discovered. Like just yeah. absolute hot garbage press coverage. Um yeah. the idea that that any fossil is our direct ancestor is questionable at absolute best. Uh, yeah, th there's a few members of Homo where that's fairly reasonable, but outside of that, no. Yeah. Like, no no yeah, within our own genus. This is like fifty million years ago. Yeah. There's or, well, uh, is it impossible that it's the yeah. direct ancestor of humans? No. Is it extremely unlikely? Yes. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, I mean, yeah, that, that fossil right there might actually be your ancestor. It's almost certainly not, though. Yeah, no, it, especially since the, the morphological um, analyses have consistently put it closer to lemurs than to our own lineage, the, the haplorines. So, yeah. yeah, no, almost certainly not our direct ancestor, and shame on the um the people who ran those stories just yeah, science them. reporting kind of sucks guys yep um like that EOS time fox news just right. made up the idea that dinosaurs farted themselves into extinction and then <laughs> right. various even stupider people ran with it <laughs> <laughs> yeah yep 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 cough matt powell cough anyway uh eosimius is a stem tarsier yeah cute little guy that's so one of those also primates like size your around. hand yeah. Tarsiers are one of those Yes, groups they are. They have they're around. No gigantic one knows eyes. Them. They do. They're like in South, what's, Southeast Asia, I think. Um, occasionally features food for, orang for orangutans. I know someone um, who was bit by a tarsier once. Unfortunate. Don't, well, it didn't break the skin. But wild it animals. Did, it, it didn't break the skin, but it did surprise her greatly. Yeah. I mean, you know, broadly speaking, um, try not to get bit by wild animals. Just yeah. as a general rule. Well, this one was being uh, kept as a pet for photo opportunities in in a uh, in, in a well in 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 Asia, and um, my friend was extremely nervous, and uh, yeah, it picked up on that. They'll they'll notice that you're not comfortable holding them, and mm -hmm. then they'll get nervous, and then if they get nervous enough, they'll give you a little nip. Yep, and that's what happened. She was fine. That's that's good. Glad to hear. Yeah. She um, also did not pay for that photograph. <laughs> Did not pay because she got bit. <laughs> right, she was like, "I'm not paying. I got bit." Uh, fair enough. Use whatever advantage you can. Uh, absolutely. To be fair, I don't think she kept the photograph either. Uh, then there's Branicella. So early, so like stem platyrine, little monkey, tiny monkey. All the primates were very small at this time, in like the early Cenozoic. I mean, uh, that's true for mammals broadly. Like, all of the, and then you name a modern group that existed at the time, were usually much, much, much smaller than they are today. Yes, yeah. Um, elephants were, like, the size of pigs, I think, at in the, the Eocene. They were not well, they were not the huge guys that we know. Probocidians. Oh, sorry, yeah, probocidians. Um, yeah, they were not the huge, towering animals that we know today. They were not there yet. Much Interestingly smaller. enough, modern probocidians are smaller than the largest probocidians ever. Significantly so in some cases. Well, I mean, that's also true for, I think it's probably true for a lot of animals like uh, rhinos, you know, yeah. Paraceratherium. Um, anyway. Possibly the biggest mammal, well, terrestrial mammal ever to live. Right. Yeah. Blue whales haven't beat by a mile, but whatever. That is that is true, yeah. Uh, being aquatic places a lot of different pressures on you. So We'll say blue whales are often called the largest uh, animals ever known to exist, but... There have been some extremely large ichthyosaurs that currently, there are some estimates that give them a run for their money. So, 
it is possible they might actually be toppled in the future by an ichthyosaur. What what ichthyosaur is that big? One of the problems is that a number of the largest um, ichthyosaur remains are currently not described, so they don't technically have a name. Dang, that's yeah. whack, yo. But they're working on it. But the thing is, like, we're finding like ichthyosaur teeth correlate pretty well with like uh, body size, mm -hmm. and they're very small compared to their body size. And we've been finding like, oh, hey, look, this is like a four inch long uh, ichthyosaur tooth. That would have to go to a very big animal if those proportions hold. Right, right, yeah. Good gravy. Um, anything you want to add on this slide? Um, no, I think I'm good on primates. Okay. You guys are weird. They are weird. A bunch of monkeys. I, well, yeah, I guess I can do this slide. Uh, Oligocene, 34 to 23 million years ago. Um, global cooling is becoming a, a thing in this time period. Uh, as you can see, like, much of North America is exposed because you're getting like, um, you know, like ice caps, ice caps mm -hmm. forming, and lots of water getting locked up as ice. So you've got a lot of land exposed. Um, so yeah. A trend which will only continue for quite a while. Mm -hmm. Yep. Uh, but you still got like the teth, like the remnants of the Tetha Sea in Eurasia. Hasn't quite closed up totally yet. But it's getting there. It's getting there. Just give, just give them some time. Uh, India has definitely contacted with Asia at this point. Um, at this point, also South America and North America are not contacted. They're still separated. No, they're, they're very close, but uh, yeah, they're still separated, which does mean that at this point we are still getting the, the full range of uh, native South American mammal or well animals in general. Um, mm -hmm. Spoiler alerts, when the land bridge forms, it goes pretty poorly on the whole for South American biodiversity and it barely makes it affect at all in North American biodiversity. I'm trying to think. So porcupines, raccoons, and armadillos are basically the only possums. animals that have been... Oh, yeah, and opossums um, are basically the only animals that have had a very successful go of it infiltrating North America from South America and basically getting past, like, the deserts of Southern North America. Mm -hmm. Yep. Did, did not go well for them, guys. It was yeah. much easier... In terms of like climate for the North American mammals going south, than the South American mammals going north. Mm -hmm. Sorry, um, guys. Uh, there were though um, some archi archipelagos that were between North and South America, which maybe like invertebrates were passing between them, or maybe even very small vertebrates. Um. So for a certain project that I'm working on, uh, it seems that there were there was like dispersal of some dung beetles from South America to North America before Neat. the continents contacted. So yeah, so they were probably island hopping uh, before they actually met up. On so, rafts yeah. of dung? <laughs> Possibly, who knows? I don't know, does, does dung, uh, does, do dung, balls of dung float? I don't know, maybe. I mean, have you ever had a floater in your toilet? The <sighs> answer is sometimes. <laughs> maybe, anyways. Depends on how fatty that diet is. That's true. I mean, they also could have just gotten like you know, blown on the winds or something. Yeah, there's, there's a whole lot more options that are much more likely than dung beetles actually dispersing on actual dung over the ocean. That's, I mean, that's who not knows? The most likely, they've got like they're like a fleet of little dung balls sailing <laughs> the seven seas. You know? Good admiral dung beetle. <laughs> yep, they like they uh, like lash all of their dung balls together into a single <laughs> round. Uh, uh, anyway, all right, uh, next slide, please. Oligocene fauna. So, sundry Oligocene fauna. Oligopithecus was a, a, a larger um, primate. He seems to be, like, closer to the, like, the Cercopithecoids and the uh, apes. So that collective group is called the Catarines. You have the Platyrines, which is a South American. Interestingly, we are, like, more... You know, we're more distantly related to the Platyrrhines than we are to the the Afro Eurasian uh, monkeys. Interesting little tidbit. So, like, it was a very early group of primates who made the the jump to South America. Oh, look, I did it correctly. Paraceratherium. I did it, Dapper. Yay me! Oh, you did. You did. That's awesome. Go Jackson. Although, rhino should be in quotations. Fair enough. Paracetamol. As should, as should camel, really. And elephant. Yeah, actually, the only thing you technically got completely correct is primate. 
<laughs> um, Pobrotherium uh, was so camels have a very interesting dispersion because like you can track them from North America to uh, Eurasia, then down into Africa. Really cool, cool stuff. Um, and lately into Australia. Yes. Oh, also South America is the, the camelids. Uh, you can also find in South America is like the vicuña and the llama, alpaca, all those guys. The guanaco. Don't forget the guanaco. I would never forget the guanaco. It sounded, uh, it sounded like you were going to, but I'll, I believe you. I was I was like, I hope Dapper fills in the audience on the guanaco. That's a, That was my <laughs> thought process. Oh, okay. it's like if I, if, I, if I get everybody else, he'll take the last one. It's true. I'm trying to include you, you know, in this. Uh, to be honest, I, I sometimes forget the Vicuña. Vicuña. Yeah. Vicuña I can't say it. Vicuña? Vicuña? I don't know. It doesn't matter. I don't speak Spanish. Anyway, uh, Fiomia, Fiomaya. Fiomi, Fiomai. What, uh, what an option. elephant we've got. Yeah, It's not an elephant, though. It is, an, uh, it is a proboscidean, yes. not an elephanted, uh, who had this weird shovel uh, tusk thing going on. Um, early elephants, early proboscideans, experimented in a lot of different ways with their tusks, which is why... <laughs> I JG said in the, in the chat, Hoven said that giraffes and rhinos couldn't bring forth, and yet here we are. <laughs> With Paraceratherium. Fair enough. Yep. Um, is that Ida? Oh, yes. Sorry, JG. Uh, yes, that was Ida's um, type fossil or oh. specimen. Um, which I guess the specimen is the type fossil, I believe. So there you go. Uh, or the, 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 the specimens don't have type fossils. The, the species that is the, the type fossil for the taxon, yes, is, is Ida. Yeah. Yeah, that um, specimen is the type. Yes. Specimen, yeah. yeah there you go. Absolutely. There you go. Um, I would be very, I don't, I don't know, I don't know if there are any elephant genomes at present. Um, I don't know if any extant elephants have their genome sequenced. I don't know. Um, I, is, I don't actually know if are the, there are any full, full, I don't know if there are full sequenced mammoth genomes. I don't know about full sequences, but I know that we've sequenced enough we have some of genes. modern elephantids that we know that um, there are two species of Loxodon extant. Yes. There's only one of Elephus, and also that Mammothus is closer to Elephus than Loxodon. Yeah, and I have a slide later where we talk about um, elephantid phylogeny, but I was just trying to remember because I don't know if like the genes that, that are involved in like tusk formation, because the tusks are incisors. Um, I don't know if they've worked all that out yet because I'd be very curious to see like genetic explanations of how you get weird shovel tuskers like that. Because uh, with with the proboscideans, you got the the modern elephants. They're all it's all the upper incisors that are like super elongate that form the tusks. Um, whereas in the past, you had upper and lower incisors. Um, sometimes they were like shovels. Some had only the the bottom incisors that were tusks which were a weird group called the dinothayers so that was neat get some four uh, tusks going yeah some had yeah four big tusks like um stego tetrabelodon so weird guy so, yeah elephants did a lot with their tusks yeah like a nankis who had this these ridiculously long tusks just ludicrously long absolutely ludicrously long uh anything you want to add no, I think we're good. All right. Well, on that note, uh, we got about five minutes till uh, really end of show. So, Dapper, Dapper the dinosaur. Yes, what that is, is going me. On on your channel. All right. Well, let me bring up a calendar here so I can take a look. All right. Uh, the twenty first. I don't know. Um, I am considering doing a reading of a long form comic book published by Jack Chick about nice. the history of islam oh no which, which in case you guys don't know he, he believes in this conspiracy theory whereby the catholic church created islam to create problems for the orthodox church for some reason and then that backfired i guess that's some 4d chess level stuff right there <laughs> yeah, i know it's completely crazy um and to do that he just makes up the uh catholic like he makes up the various historical figures were Catholic that we know were not Catholic. And then well, his justification for this is like, well, 
it's just as much it's just as good as catholic it's like okay even if you want to say that like you would disagree with them just as much as the catholics you know they weren't actually catholics though right like they rejected the papacy and everything right but like yeah so i'm thinking i might do that on the 21st um that's amazing well, yeah it's that that part, check on history that you you shouldn't use the word uh makes it, it he made he he's gone he's gone on to live with uh the lord jesus now so he he, he no longer oh, does that's anything a good point. jack chick yeah. jack chick is gone and uh his company did make a few uh cartoons after he was gone and they they just didn't have that same feel to them so they've mostly given up and now they just that same like xenophobic racist flair that he has yeah basically <laughs> okay all right just making sure um let's see um tuesday the 24th uh jackson you're you're supposed to be on my channel i'll be there and okay. we're gonna we're gonna beat up dr. on another jackson, jackson aren't we yes <clears throat> dr charles jackson bad jackson yep he's um, gonna get a, a right uh a right thrashing thursday the 26th should be the next update for my speculative evolution project i know those updates are uh very spaced out at this point they're like more than two months apart but um unfortunately the algorithm kind of hates them so i can't make them very often especially since they usually take more than a week to make so yeah um so that's gonna be the 26th at least it should be i have no idea about the 28th uh the 31st should be uh, Kent with Bent 83. I don't have a title for it yet, but you know, come up with something. It'll be fine. <laughs> um, then at first, if you go over to my off topic channel, Top Hats Off, we should be playing uh, Power Rangers Jungle Beast, the Power Rangers RPG of Let's Actual Play um, that I do with uh, Science Side Up is there. I'm there. TD Lanes, one of our friends, is there. Um, Smitty, who's been in chat, is there. So it's a, it's a fun time. Um, I've got a whole bunch of art that I did. Bent Hovind, my co-host for Kent with Bent, did some music for it. It's all nice. sorts of cool stuff. Yes, it's a lot of fun. There's currently um, three episodes that you, well, there's two and a half episodes that you can watch. And by a half, I mean it's like four minutes, whereas the, the episodes are like two hours. So, you know, do the math yourself. I don't care. Um, but there are three videos that you can watch that, that you know, show us the, the trials and tribulations of this team of Rangers. Um, then on the second, it should be uh, my third and final episode on pretend Rabbi Yosef Mizrahi um, <laughs> called the Jewish Matt Powell, because he's surprisingly similar to Matt Powell in most ways, except that he's Jewish. Uh, and that's about as far ahead as I can really look into my channel. Fair enough. Um, I think we will probably be able to finish the Cenozoic next time. Nice. I think we're I mean, we're in the a legacy now. I think we should be able to finish it next time. Maybe we'll see. Um, if we do, <clears throat> that means the next. That means the the next Thursday, will be uh, back to our uh, our book, our creationist book that we're. Wait, you're not gonna you're not gonna go into like Wayne Barlow, and his like, After Man series. Oh no, I don't think so. <laughs> Yeah, did man get here by evolution or by creation? Which, fun fact, that is what the book looks like. I have it. <laughs> I imagine it originally had a dust cover. Maybe mine, mine didn't. I can't like the pictures of it online, right. or it's just the blue book. Maybe really? it did. Oh wait, That's no, because it it's like. a really skinny book, isn't it? Yeah, it is really super skinny. Yeah, I probably didn't have a dust cover in that case because I'm thinking like, oh, you know, a hardcover book is probably like you know, at least a, you know, like a few centimeters thick, but it's like barely a centimeter thick isn't it yeah no it's yeah it's, it's pretty thin the the words on the pages are pretty big which is why we're just reading right through it um and, might as well and considering uh, and I, I think oh, the last, like, considering the arguments are, are extremely popular still today uh, i don't think creation has put it down long enough to gather dust so the cover <laughs> would just be a waste this, Wait, so nebula. really this is like um Frontline Kent Hoven stuff right here. I mean, it's from the '60s, oh, yeah. so that's bleeding edge Kent Hoven material. Yeah. And uh, ne Nebulin said the artwork is going to be great for the Spec Evo. Thank you, Nebulin. So she's one of my uh, my patrons or channel members. I, look, they both get access to the Discord server where I share the stuff early. So sh she's been able to see um, the the work in progress art for the Speculative Evolution video. It's it is nice. it's going to be pretty good. I think this is the, my best set of art for that project to date. So go check it out. 
Yeah, absolutely. Um, and like I said, Dapper, you are definitely invited to, to come back uh, for um, our, our read through. Plus, also, I think I think I said last time we're going to skip like the last three chapters of the book because it's just theology and I don't care. Yeah. Not interested. Um, so I might definitely... be interested, but certainly not on air. No, I mean, not the not with the, the theology stuff, but with... Um, no, I mean, the... the theology stuff might actually be interesting for me to read, but I wouldn't do it on air. Oh, it's not, it's not oh anything I'm I sure... About online. I'm sure you read it and be like, what the actual heck were they thinking? You know, yeah. <laughs> reading it. <laughs> like, um, because if they get science that badly wrong, I'm sure they get history and even theology that badly wrong too. So, Oh, anyway. I've seen some creationists get the Bible very badly wrong and not even in ways that they don't like they have to, to be creationists. Mm -hmm. Like there's a creationist out there who has to say that first and second Timothy were written by Timothy. They were written to Timothy. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Well, uh, well, you know, bad science, bad history, bad theology. That's that's creation has been a nutshell, isn't it? So. Uh, yeah, to a large extent. Yeah. All right. So with that in mind, I would like to thank you, Dapper, for coming on and uh, braving the like first half of the Cenozoic with us. Thank you. And thank you, Peter, for producing and hosting as always. You're and then welcome. Thank you, everybody in the live chat. For, uh, for being here and witnessing it with us. So uh, thank you for coming and uh, we are signing off.